importance of a good example. The fact is, what we say does not resonate with others nearly as much as what we do. People watch and hear. They remember far more of what they see than what they hear. It was true in the first century, and it's true in the 21st century, and the mandate of the text, which was shared a moment ago from 1 Timothy 4, indicates that Timothy had a responsibility to take heed not just to what he taught, but first and foremost to how he lived, how he behaved. And what was true of that young man is true of all of us without any regard to age. We are, as people of God, whether we're young Christians or seasoned veterans in the service of the Lord, to be very careful that we set the right example before the people around us. I wanted to share with you as an introduction to this morning's study some things that I came across in preparation for today's message. And I hope as you hear these things that they will uh, in some way challenge you as they challenge me to be careful about where I go, what I do, and what I say. These are the words of Mark Twain. Always do right. This will surprise some people and astonish the rest. He further said, fewer things are harder to put up with than the annoyance of a good example. Gilbert West wrote, Example is a lesson that all men can read. James Thume, if you try to improve one person by being a good example, you will improve too. If you try to improve someone without being a good example, you won't improve anybody. Henry Ward Beecher wrote, If you want your neighbor to see what Christ will do for him, let him see what Christ has done for you. George Bernard Shaw made this observation. Keep yourself clean and bright. You are the window through which you must see the world. And I would add in relationship to that, we are also the window through which the world must see God. The Apostle Paul said in his second letter to the church at Corinth, You're our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. We walk out of here later this morning with the understanding that we are representatives of our Lord. People are watching, and they're judging our master. They're judging his church by what they see and hear in us. Oliver Goldsmith said, You can preach a better sermon with your life than with your lips. Edgar Guest, in one of my favorite poems, conveyed that same message when he said, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one would walk with me than merely point the way. I could share with you the entire uh, poetry, but I'll not uh, do that this morning because we need to move on. John Donne said, of all commentaries on the scriptures, good examples are the best ones. And Oliver Goldsmith said this, people seldom improve when they have no other model than themselves to copy. And one final note, we can do more good by being good than in any other way. Roland Hill. All of those statements from names you may or may not recognize validate what we're saying this morning from our text, that we are an example. People are watching. We need to make sure they see the right thing. And you may say, well, I don't want to be an example. It doesn't work that way. You're being watched wherever you go. It begins in the home and then the workplace and the community and beyond. Are we showing the world what they need to see? Jesus, in Matthew 23, indicted the Pharisees and said to the audience that he was addressing on that occasion of them, You do as they say and not as they do, for they say and do not. 
Why was it necessary for Jesus to single them out and to make that statement? Because he knew that those who watched the Pharisees would follow their example rather than listen to their words, and that was not the right course of action. I have seen this played out in a modern setting in the lives of preachers who stand in pulpits very much like this one, who are far more talented, educated, and far brighter than me, and deliver powerful messages, but they walk out of the building, go into the community, and they behave like anyone else in the world. Those kinds of messages fall on deaf ears. Jesus was in the setting of Matthew 23, condemning the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. When we profess a religion that we do not practice, we are as hypocritical as they, and our example is not good, but bad. In the Sermon on the Mount, which God willing, at some point later this year, we hope to return to our study on Sunday nights, Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16, Jesus uses the expressions that we all have known most, if not all, of our lives and really understand what they are designed to convey. You're the salt of the earth. If somebody says of you, you're the salt of the earth, they've paid you one of the highest compliments that any person can be paid. And we understand what that means. He said, you're not only the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. And what's he saying to his disciples? Essentially what Paul said to Timothy. People are watching. Make sure they see in you what ought to be seen. Set the right kind of example. And it's not hard to know what that involves if we will just be students of the word. Every cook understands how important it is to follow the recipe precisely. Leave an ingredient out or add a little more or a little less than required and it impacts the outcome. Every seamstress understands how essential it is to follow the pattern. If you vary from the pattern, the result will not be the desired end that you were seeking. You've got to stick with the recipe. You've got to stick with the pattern if you want the outcome to be what you desire. And every builder understands this as well. Growing up, we did a lot of our own building at home. We built all of the homes that my parents, my brother, and my sisters currently reside in. And we built truss roofs for three of those four houses. And on the first, we built rafters. We had a pattern for the rafters. We used the same pattern to cut every rafter because if you cut one and then use it to mark the next one, and you do that in succession. By the time you're finished, you're going to have a roof that is longer on one end than the other because you keep changing the pattern. The same is true if you're using trusses. You build a pattern for the truss, and you make every truss according to the pattern. It's essential if things are to turn out as you desire them. And what the scripture says is this, we have a pattern as well. Follow the pattern and we will succeed. Ignore the pattern and we're destined for failure. And who is or what is that pattern? The apostle Peter said of Jesus, he did no sin and guile was never found in his mouth. But he left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Do you know how to measure your success or failure as a child of God? Examine your life in light of the life of the Lord. That's not what we typically do. We tend to compare ourselves among ourselves. But that doesn't work because the example is flawed. But when we compare ourselves to Jesus, 
we get a real reflection of who we are and where we stand in relation to, to him and the kind of example that we are to set. When we veer from the pattern, we veer from Christ, we get further from heaven and sadly closer to hell. So what does the text this morning tell Timothy and thus by implication all of us? Let no one despise your youth. Now I su suppose that the first question that we want to raise is, well, how oh was Timothy? And I can't give you an exact age. I can tell you that the consensus is that he was probably somewhere in the area of 30 at this time. That certainly sounds young to me. I would consider someone 30 to be a youth today. Timothy, as a young man, set the believers an example. You see, this is just not something that old folks like me are supposed to do. This is something that is mandated of every child of God. The world is watching. Jesus is your example. Follow his example and show the world him. In fact, when you read the full message of the Apostle Paul in all of his epistles, you'll find him encouraging his readers to follow him, but to follow him only as he followed Jesus. And that's what we need to be saying. Parents, teach your children. You need to follow us as your parents to the extent or degree that we're walking in the steps of Jesus. If we stray from the path, you stay with Jesus. I dare say, I doubt many parents have ever sat down and said to their youngsters, this is what we want you to do. This is our goal. It should be your goal. Follow me, even as I also follow Jesus. The sad reality, and it pains me to say this, is that often, even in the home, our children are not seeing the kind of example they ought to see. We're not setting forth before them a life lived in imitation of the life of Jesus. John said in 1 John 2, I believe it's verse 6, we ought to walk even as he also walked. And there the expression walk is a way of addressing our entire life and conduct. We're to live as Jesus lived. Well, let's get a little more specific. Paul, what do you mean? about my example what aspects of my life do I need to be conscientious of as I think about the example that I'm setting well this is the English standard version if you have the King James translation there's an extra word inserted into the text that's not found in the English standard and other more recent translations and it's the word spirit will just look at our text as we find it in the English Standard this morning. Be an example in word. What you say. There are words that as a Christian are not compatible in my judgment with my Christian calling. There are words that I just don't use because they do not seem to be compatible with my relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, as Bible students, I'm sure you're familiar with these verses. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. And one that Mark reminded me of not very long ago in Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I will ask you a question. I don't expect an answer other than for you to consider it in your own mind. Would you be comfortable if your children or grandchildren repeated publicly everything they heard you say? every word they heard you use. 
And I want to remind you that God's hearing them already. I'm in a unique position as a gospel preacher. On occasion, I will be in the presence of someone who will use language that they themselves know is inappropriate, and then they'll turn to me and say, Oh, preacher, I forgot you were here. I'm sorry. And my response always is, Don't concern yourself with me. God hears. That's the one that you need to be concerned with. And by the way, Jesus said, we will one day give an account for every careless word, the King James says, idle, which we have spoken. Are we setting a good example in word? And what about conduct? Philippians 1.27 reminds us that our conduct, and again, here the King James says conversation, but the meaning is conduct, ought to be that which becometh the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are currently in an environment where people, by and large, don't believe that how we live matters much as long as we are believers. There is no correlation between salvation and behavior. It's salvation and belief. But the reality is that the scriptures say that our belief has to be backed up by proper behavior. In fact, Paul wrote to Timothy, I hope to come to you shortly. But if I tarry long, I've written these things that you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. You cannot divorce behavior from belief because it's our behavior that validates our belief. Timothy, watch your words. Watch your conduct. Do things that are as God desires, not as the world desires. There are times when the world may go one direction and a child of God will go in the opposite direction because it's the way God is leading. And we must not give in to the pressure of the majority. We must not surrender to the easy, but stay with the difficult if it's God's way. And if you read Matthew 7, 13 and 14, you know God's way is hard. It is narrow. It is restrictive. The world's way is easy, broad, wide, and heavily traveled. Set the right example, and you'll be just one who stands out among so many who do not. But the one that God will take note of, and the one whose life God will bless. Be an example in love. Now, I hit a button too quickly. And that, again, is not simply something that we talk about is something that we demonstrate. I can't think of an example of love without thinking first of Jesus himself who left heaven, came into our world, and went to Calvary for us. An act of love. I think of his ministry in the story in Luke 10 of the Good Samaritan. The actions of the Samaritan were prompted by compassion or love. And then I remind myself, as I so often remind you, that God does not want us to love in word or tongue exclusively, but into deed and truth. That is, we've got to back up what we say by how we live and what we do. Timothy, be an example in your love. How do I do that? By living life compassionately by caring for others and demonstrating that care through action. It doesn't matter how often we say it. If it is not backed up by deeds, it is not true. Be an example in love, in faith. And here the idea is trust. The Bible teaches us repeatedly that as people of God, we walk by faith faith. We trust him. We acknowledge that he is sovereign of the universe, that he is or ought to be Lord of our life, and we will lean on him and find comfort in his promises. 
Does that mean that everything is going to be easy for us? Of course not. One of the things that really ought to stand out if you read the Gospels carefully is the abject honesty of Jesus in telling disciples that discipleship is costly. Follow me and it may ruin your marriage, it may ruin your family, it may in fact ruin your life physically. But you will live eternally. Is that what God desires? That your marriage be ruined? That your family be destroyed? That your life be taken? Of course not. But it can happen when you put Christ first, seek first the kingdom and righteousness, after all, he said, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword in Matthew 10. And then he described how fathers and their sons and mothers and their daughters, husbands and their wives would be at odds with each other over the gospel. But the gospel has to win out. We have to trust God first. But in our world, so few in my judgment, even in the church today, some have forgotten to trust Him. We put ourselves in the hands of others and trust them over Him. That's the wrong example. Trust in anything but God, and you're going ultimately to be disappointed. Walk by faith, not by sight. Be an example in purity as well. Live the upright life that God calls his people to live. The Apostle Paul wrote again to the young preacher Timothy earlier about the importance of living the kind of life that God calls us to live in a world that has a form of godliness but denies its power. And then in his second letter, the last from his pen, he said, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Live pure, upright lives. In chapter 5 of this epistle, from which our text comes, he urges Timothy, keep yourself pure a challenge to all Christians. And I want you to know that this is just not something that occurs in 1 Timothy. Here's the passage in Titus 2, which essentially says the same thing, in all things show yourself a pattern. The English standard says a model of good works. Teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech. And why is this so important? So that those who are against you and against him will be condemned by your life and your example. Peter makes the same argument in 1 Peter chapter 4. Don't suffer as a murderer, a thief, a busybody, busy body, an evildoer, but if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. But glorify God on this behalf and know, and if you read the full context, of those five chapters in 1 Peter, you'll discover Peter saying, if you want to overcome the critics, just live an upright life. You see, there's no argument and really no defense against a good example. And why is this so important? Well, first, because a good example is a reflection of a good heart heart where God resides, where Jesus lives, where he have, we have crowned him King and Lord and Master. It's in Matthew 12, verses 33 through 37, that Jesus reminded his disciples of this fundamental fact. He does so in the context of our words again, back to where we really began with 1 Timothy 4.12. He said, good words good heart. Bad words, bad heart. Now having said that, I need to pause and tell you I am not in any way implying that we won't from time to time 
set the wrong example. To be the perfect pattern all the time would require sinlessness on our part, and that's something we can't offer. But we have a perfect pattern to look to and when we stray to return to. When our hearts are what they ought to be, that will be our goal every day. You will go through life and face challenges, and sometimes you will succeed, and sometimes you will fail. We all do. But if we keep coming back to God, keep our hearts pure, it will ultimately be well with our soul. The life of David is one of the best examples of this that we can cite. He was a man after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 13, 14 and 15. But you know as well as I do, he was a flawed man with a good heart. And when he messed up, and recognized his sin, he came back to his sinning. That's what we must do. Our example ultimately determines our reputation, good or bad. The choice is ours. And we need to be, ladies and gentlemen, far more concerned with how God uses us than how the world uses. I don't care if I get likes from men as long as I get likes from God. And that can only happen when we're conscientious about our example. No matter what we say, folks, how we live and what we do says a whole lot more. We can shout from the rooftop our love for God. But if people don't see it in our lives, they'll never listen to our words. What are people hearing? What are they seeing? What kind of example are we setting? Paul Gilbert wrote these words, in my judgment, reflecting on 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2. If you're writing a gospel, a chapter a day, by deeds that you do, by words that you say. Men read what you write, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? Someday this life will end for all of us and eternity will begin. And hopefully there will be those left behind to remember. What will they remember? What kind of legacy will we leave? It depends on the kind of example we said. So I close with the words of Solomon in Proverbs 22, verse 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor than silver and gold. Your choice is made by how you live your life, how you serve the Lord, the example you set. Let's walk out of here determined to live for God, to follow Jesus, and be more concerned with what the Father thinks than what the world says. And let the world see Jesus in us. He's the window through which the world will see the Master. May they see what they ought to see as we live for him. If you're doing that, keep on. God bless you. If not, it's time to begin. We stand ready to assist you. If you want to obey Jesus, you come with a penitent heart. Believing that Jesus was the Son of God will take your confession, immerse you in water, the blood of Christ will wash away your sins. He'll add you to his church, and you can begin to live the life that he calls you to live. And you'll never regret doing that, but you may indeed regret forever your failure. So do you know my Jesus, and will you come to him? If not, as together we stand and sing. Art that's weary, standing alone of
thank Roger for another excellent message. For any of us who are parents, we know that the things that we do go much further than the things that we say. A few announcements to share with you. Among our sick, uh, Paul Hickman had gallbladder surgery last Sunday. He is at home and recovering and seems to be doing well with that. Clarence Deloche is now at home as well and has completed rehab, or at least the inpatient rehab. George Pickens, Carolyn Kimball's brother, is still uh, waiting on his heart bypass surgery, and he's in Huntington, uh, West Virginia with family. Isaac Rowe, Sarah Schaefer's grandson, is in the Maryland hospital with coronavirus at this time. Just keep him in your prayers. He is 19. Invite you uh, to be with us every opportunity you have. Our next gathering will be Wednesday evening at 7. We'll continue our summer series then. Uh, also remind folks that you'll find things online. Uh, we have a Sunday morning Bible study. This uh, assembly and our Wednesday evenings are always online as well. So if you happen to miss an assembly or something of that nature, you can always catch up. Following our final song, Adam Burkhart will uh, have our closing prayer. So with that, thank you for being here. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday. Yeah. Number 348, 348, we'll sing the first and last verses. If you're able to, please stand. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this hour of worship. We hope that our worship this morning has been in accordance with your will. We pray that as we leave this place, you will go with us and help us be that example that you would like us to be in the world to our neighbors and friends, that they might see you through us. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> 